right, good morning. It's good to see you here today. I'm John Carney, pastor at Blue Ridge Baptist Church, and we're glad you're here. Uh, we're going to talk today about anticipation, more specifically, our future hope and our present reality. And in fact, hope is something that everybody needs, especially in this day and time. And in fact, if we have hope, we can face just about anything, can't we? As long as we know tomorrow is going to be a little bit brighter than today. I remember hearing the story that Billy Graham told about visiting a young man who had terminal illness. And uh, uh, as he talked with the young man, the young man finally said this. He said, I would not be afraid of death if I just knew what was coming next, what was on the other side. Now, you know, we, uh, we're afraid of all the things that we don't understand and that we can't tell the future. In fact, that's what's so uh, concerning about this coronavirus we don't know how far it will really spread. We don't know if, when they're going to find a vaccine and when the whole thing will slowly just kind of dissipate. We're afraid of the unknown. Well, today I can't tell you everything in life, but I can tell you one thing, and that is about your future, or at least what your future can be on the other side of earth, on the other side of this life. And I want you to know, through a relationship to Jesus Christ, that future can be bright. We're looking at hope. And I want to look at a couple of verses this morning found in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8. We can start with verse 18 in Romans chapter 8, where Paul says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And then down a little farther in verse 23. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoptions as the sons of Sons, the redemption of our bodies. And finally, he says in Romans 8, 24, For in this hope we are saved. Today, we're finishing our look at salvation. A few weeks weeks back, we looked at our need, our need for salvation, our need for forgiveness and a right relationship with God. And then we moved on to redemption, God's plan to redeem us, to forgive us. And we discovered that in a moment of time, if we call out to God, we can be forgiven and have a right relationship with Him. And last week, we looked at something called sanctification, which is God's plan and God's purpose to redeem our lives, to renew us, to put us on a better path of a satisfying life that not only satisfies us, but gives glory to God. And today, we're going to look at something called glorification. Now, what in the world is that? In a nutshell, glorification is this. It is our future hope and our present reality. And that is, of course, if Jesus Christ is our Lord and our Savior. Today we're going to look at what hope is all about. And then we're going to look at what hope can be fulfilled in your life right here and now at this moment in time. And finally, we want to look at the future hope if Jesus Christ that you can have if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. First of all, what is hope? Well, I remember growing up hearing a song on the radio called Anticipation. It was a Carly Simon song, and the lyrics, at least the catchphrase, simply went, Anticipation, anticipation is making me late. Anticipation, it's keeping me waiting. Now, I remember hearing that on the radio, but even more than that, I remember that in a Heinz ketchup commercial. They had that playing behind a ketchup bottle, uh, uh, dan- uh, dangling over on top of this wonderful-looking hamburger waiting for that ketchup to fall down. And uh, it was so thick, it took forever for it to fall. And you were anticipating, longing for it to get on the burger and get busy eating it. Now, that's what anticipation is. It's something that we long for, we hunger for, we long to have it in our life. There's a lot of things that we hunger for. Uh, I remember when I was in school, I longed to graduate. I longed, in fact, I had the days counted until I was going to graduate. I knew every one. Kids can't wait for a lot of things. They can't wait for Christmas. They can't wait for their birthday. They're excited. They're longing for that. I was a youth minister for years, and I remember a lot of 15-year-olds who longed to be 16. Why? So that they get their very own driver's license. I ran into a young lady the other day, and uh, she's getting married, and uh, she cannot wait. She's counting the days. Uh, In our family, we're expecting a grandchild, and we can't wait either. In just a few weeks, uh, we're going to find out whether it's a boy or a girl. We're excited. We feel anticipation. That's what hope is. Hope is something that we long for. We can't wait for it to be a reality. 
And that is what glorification is. Someone said it's experienced reality. Glorification is when you hope for something and then not only hope for it, it actually comes true. And that's what the Christian can experience. In Romans 8, 24, he said, for we were saved in this hope. It's hope. Hope is something you long for, but you don't see it at the time, do you? Hebrews 11.1 1 said, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You don't see it yet, but you know it's coming. Hope is described in the Old Testament in a lot of ways. I won't try to pronounce the Hebrew words, but there's at least three different words used. One means to stretch for. You try to reach for it. You can almost see it, but you can't get it. Another one means to wait, to long for in your part. And the last one simply means to hope for Now, when you hope for something, hope is just not enough. You have to have an object of your hope, don't you? And a lot of people hope for all kinds of things, some things that disappoint. Paul said that you should not hope for riches. Why? Because riches are uncertain. If you're hoping for them, they can disappoint you. Some days you wake up and the stock market's up. Some days it's down. Some day you wake up in a house that you love and you treasure, and the next day it's gone too. This past week, uh, we had a funeral service for a lovely lady in our church who was a charter member. In her early days, she had a real nice home only a few blocks from our church. Well, one more evening, she woke up in the middle of the night and found her house in flames. Fortunately, and praise God, everyone got out of the house, but they got out of the house only with the clothes on their back. Nothing more. They had nothing. She lost her house. But fortunately for her, she was someone who didn't put her hope in things. She put her hope in her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and, uh, and God, and she found that over the years that God was much more reliable. Paul went on to say in, in 1, Corinthians, 1 Timothy 6.17, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain but to put their hope in God, who richly provides with everything for our enjoyment. You see, this lady who passed away, her name was Dietze, and she put her hope in God. And he provided her with what? He provided her with good friends that that, that got her through the rough times. Uh, He provided her in time with a new house. But more than that, he provided her a rich and fruitful life. The object of our hope must be God. And when we have hope, What hope does is hope turns to trust. One of my favorite verses is Hebrews 11.6. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You see, first you believe in God, who he was. Jesus sent his son, that he died on the cross and rose from the grave. You believe those things, but then you hope in God. And next... It leads to trust in God. You trust in Him because you're convinced that He has your best interest at heart. John wrote in 1 John 4.10, This is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. In John 10.10, Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. Hope moves to trust because we believe in God. We believe that he's seeking out the best for us. I remember a number of years ago, I read a great book by Peter Keller. Uh, He wrote a book about the good shepherd. That's what Jesus said in John 10, I am the good shepherd. And he knew a lot about being a shepherd. He was a shepherd over in Australia. He had a flock of sheep that he raised. And one day he got a great deal. He bought a sheep dog at a discount price. It only had one hook. And that was this dog was wild. This dog had been abused. This dog was just very difficult. Well, the first day on his ranch, what did the dog do? The dog ran away. He never found him. But every day he put out food. Every day he put out water. Never saw the dog, but the food and the water were always gone. Weeks passed, and then one day while he was tending the sheep, suddenly he felt a cold nose in the back of his hand. The dog was brushing up against him. The dog chose to trust him. He said in time, the dog not only chose to trust him, the dog chose to obey him. And that's what trust does. We move from hope to trust to obedience. I want to read a passage of Scripture to you from Psalms chapter uh, 33, verses 18 through 20. 
And uh, in this day and time with uncertainty, I think this is a great passage of encouragement, but also shows you a little bit about what hope is all about. It says in Psalms 33, verses 18 through 20, But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear Him, on those whose hope is unfailing love, in, on those who hope in His unfailing love, to deliver them from death and to keep them alive in famine. We, wo- we wait and hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. God stands beside us. He can see us through any situation. We stand upon Him, stand before Him, and lean upon Him. And then a little farther over in Psalms 147, verse 11, the psalmist says, The Lord delights in those who fear Him, who put their hope in His unfailing love. I want you to notice something there. Hope and fear are tied together. That doesn't seem normal, does it? But it's true. When you have faith, when you believe, when you hope, it moves to trust, and then many times it relates to fear. Have you ever known anybody in your life that you both had hope in and you were also afraid of? I did. His name was Dad. That's what I called him. My dad loved me. My dad believed in me. No one in my life, except my mom, I guess, ever did anything more for my dad than me. My dad stood beside me. My dad forgave me. My dad enabled me. My dad helped me. But I also feared my dad. I guess as a young child, maybe I physically feared him. As an adult, I didn't do that. But as an adult, I feared to disappoint him. My hope and my trust in God leads to the fact that I also fear him. I do not want to disappoint him. If you hope in God and trust in him, then as Billy Graham says, you will bend your will to his. You will learn to obey him. Someone has said, to hope in God is to stand in awe of him and his power and with confidence that God will faithfully perform his word. Thus, hope becomes trust in the righteous character of God. Now, that's what hope is. Well, what can we hope for today, right this moment, right this second? Well, the Bible tells us a lot of things we can hope for. We can hope for forgiveness. When you've messed up, when you've done wrong, God will forgive you. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In Him we have redemption through the, His blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. You can be forgiven right here and now. What else can you have? You can have the presence of God. A verse that we looked at last week in Ephesians 1, 13, Paul writes, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. What can you have right here and now? You can have companionship. You can have the presence of God that stands beside you no matter what you face. You'll never be alone. You can feel God's love. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He lets you feel his love and his grace. But not only that, what else can you have? You can have the power of God. We all love Philippians 4.13. It's on mugs and shirts everywhere. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. God can strengthen you through any situation, through the ordained, through the horrific. And finally, you can have the fruit of God. Galatians 5.22 says in verse 23, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Anybody need any of those things? I do, every day. God can empower you to have those characteristics in your life. All that and more can be experienced when? Today. If you choose Jesus as your Savior and your Lord and choose to walk with Him day by day. But there is more. There is future hope. And if we ever needed it, we need it today. Future hope. Something out there that God has for you that you can claim and count on. And what are those? Well, there are a lot of things, but I'm going to mention two this morning. One is that Jesus will return. He's coming back. After Jesus' resurrection, he spent 40 days with his disciples. He, he did miracles. He, he stood among them. And in fact, even he uh, stood among 500 people at one time. But finally, the day came and God took him back to heaven. In Acts chapter 1, verse 11, it says, angels spoke and said, This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way that you have seen him go up into heaven. He's, he went up. But someday he's coming back for us. Jesus is returning. Over in 2 Peter 3.10, Peter says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear 
uh, with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. He will come back, but he will come back differently than before. Before he came as a suffering servant, but then when he returns, he will come back as Lord and as judge. Now, you know, today many folks mock Jesus, don't they? They mock faith in him. But the Bible says when he returns, Philippians tells us that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. There will be no doubt. There will be no unbelievers then. They will all know that Jesus is Lord. Now, we will know that. That is a promise. But what is another promise? The promise also I want to share about is the promise of heaven, that we will get to experience heaven. Now, what is heaven like? Uh, well, there's a lot to unpack in heaven, but I want to share just a few things. And what I want to take it from is the book of Revelation, chapter 21. And there's several verses in there that give us pictures of what heaven is like. Not a full picture, but at least some to know and to hope for. It starts out very interesting in, in uh, verse 1. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Now, one of the things at the very end there you would think is just nothing and very insignificant is pretty big. He says there will be no sea in heaven. Now, what does that mean? Have you ever been out to sea and watched it? I love to watch the tides roll in. I watch, love the waves. I remember going to California. I love going down to the Gulf. But if you look out in that ocean, you look far and far away, what do you see? You see just forever. If you want to get from where you are to the people on the other side of the ocean, uh, your chances are slim and none. Uh, you'd have to take an airplane or a boat, and it separated people forever. In heaven, there will be no separation. Nothing to separate us from others, nothing to hinder us. There will be no seas. But not only that, in verse 3 it says, Behold, and most importantly, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. You know, in the book of John, it talks about when Jesus came, and it says in the Greek language, he would tabernacle among us. He would live among us. And when Jesus was here, he walked among the people, he healed them, he laughed with them, he weeped with them, he stood with them. And that's what heaven will be like. Jesus will be there. We'll all get to experience and live among him. You know the best thing about heaven? The best thing about heaven is that Jesus will be there. Billy Graham, in one of his last books, was, wrote a little summary of the book of John in just a sentence. He said, the summary of the book of John, the gospel of John, is this. Jesus says, uh, you can choose. And what can you choose? You can choose to be with me and where I am, or you can choose to be where I am not. Heaven is where Jesus is. And you know, that is a choice that all of us can make. We all get to choose whether to be with Jesus or not. Looking on farther in this passage in verse 4. And it says, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes and no more pain. Tom Hanks in the movie A League of Their Own said to one of his uh, female players, There is no crying in baseball. Well, there's also no crying and no tears in heaven. Heaven is a great and glorious place. In fact, many several smaller things I saw in this passage one is heaven is great. It tells us the streets are made of gold in verse 21. It says that there is no night. In fact, why? Because it says in verse 23, the glory of God lights up the whole place. The place is huge. It also says in verse 27, nothing impure goes in there. And it also tells us whatever curse that we had in this life will all be gone in the life to come. And not only that, it describes a tree that has fruit on it, a different fruit every month of the year, every time there's something new there. But most of all, heaven is grand because why? Because Jesus is there. Ultimately, there's a big decision everyone must make, and it determines your future, whether you have a hope or you don't have a hope. And in Revelation 27, verse 7, it says, He who overcomes will inherit all this. If you choose God, you'll inherit everything that God has to offer. And I will be his God and he will be my son. If you believe and call on the name of Christ to be your Lord and Savior, you will inherit all this and much more. But if you choose not to believe and not to receive Jesus and his gift of forgiveness, if you choose not to be with him, then Revelation 21 verse 8 says this, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Now what we're talking about is hell. 
No one likes to talk about hell, but it's reality. Now, what makes heaven glorious is the same thing that makes hell horrible. And that is in heaven, Jesus is there. In hell, Jesus is not. I've heard some people foolishly say that they're going to dance with the devil in hell. They are thinking there's going to be partying going on there. They're wrong. Hell is, is not Satan's headquarters. Hell is his judgment. The Bible tells us that uh, Satan is a prince of this world, not of hell. And when all is said and done, he will be thrown into hell just like everyone else. Let me take you one last thing to the greatest sermon ever preached in the Bible. It's found in John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, the greatest sermon is preached to one man, Nicodemus. And in this uh, passage, he tells Nicodemus three things. One, he tells him God's plan for his life. And that's in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Then he tells us about God's heart in verse 17 of that passage. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. And finally, He tells Him our destiny. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned. If you believe, God spares you. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. God created created a plan to save you from hell. God longs for everyone to avoid hell and to join Him in heaven. But ultimately, you get to decide whether you will live with God forever or live without Him forever. God pleads with you to join Him. I heard a story of a young woman who married a man her family did not approve of. Shortly after they married, they moved to his country. They moved to another country. Shortly after, not too many years passed and the man passed away. He didn't leave his wife anything. She struggled to get by. She worked all she could, but all she could afford was a tiny little attic apartment. She had a small son who she tried to raise and love in that time. In remembering those days, a small son remembered the only good days were the days when his mother would sit down with him and tell him the story of her home. said it was a beautiful home. It was a home with a large porch and, and a lot of grassy fields nearby. It was a home where there was always plenty to eat every day. She enjoyed those stories. Finally, one day, a letter came in the mail. When she opened it up, a check fell out and a small slip of paper with two words on it, come home. That's what God tells to each and every one of us. He calls us to come home because he loves us. This past Saturday, I did the funeral for that lady I spoke of, Miss Dietze. In the weeks leading up to her uh, death, I visit her in the hospital and at home. And every time as I would pray with her and talk with her, I finally tell her that, uh, Dietze, we're praying that you're going to feel better soon. And her answer will always be, why? Why pray for that? Because I want to go home. She was ready to go home. She was ready to be in heaven. We did the funeral Saturday and and the day before, we were at the funeral home, and a couple of her children were talking. One of them told about something she said every time she was at church, and they are about to leave. She would tell her friends goodbye, and she said, I'll see you here next time, next Sunday, if I don't get a better offer. And then one of the other children looked at the casket and says, I guess she got a better offer. The truth is, you'll never get a better offer than the love and the grace that Jesus has for you. And that's what we hope for each and every one of you today. Let's have a word of prayer. Then I have uh, one last little thing to share. Dear Lord, if there's anyone here today who doesn't have hope, please give them the courage to turn to you and to receive you as Savior and Lord right here and right now. And Lord, for all the rest of us who already know you and believed in you and seek to trust in you, rebuild in our heart the confidence knowing that you have a future for us right here and now and you have a more glorious future for the days ahead. We love you, Lord. We thank you for loving us. We ask you to see us through these turbulent times, to stand beside us, and to give encouragement to every heart. We love you, and thank you for loving us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, two last little things. One, a riddle. We can't leave without that. You all remember that? A little girl went to the doctor, was feeling ill. And the question is, why did the little girl not tell the doctor that she had eaten glue? 
And, of course, the answer is because their lips were sealed. All right, you can groan over that one. We need to continue to pray, folks. We love you. Uh, we're going to seek more ways to contact you. And, but God has a purpose for you and for our church in the days ahead. Keep praying for each other. Keep contacting. Keep giving. And God's going to do great things. We love you. Contact me anytime. God bless you. You have a great day.